So we've been studying through First Kings um, the past few weeks. Specifically, we've been looking at the story of King Solomon, who was King David's son. And last week we talked about mainly about the temple that Solomon built, the temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem, uh, where David had established Jerusalem as the capital city uh, for the nation of Israel, but was not permitted by God to build him a temple there. Solomon, though, he was actually instructed to build this temple, which then became the centralized place of worship for Israel, and it symbolized God's long-term residency uh, among the Jews. So that construction of the temple was considered one of Solomon's greatest accomplishments, uh, not just because it was so ornate and for its lavish beauty, but because of what it represented. Uh, so Solomon, like his father, David, was in many ways a model of the Messiah, the chosen one. Uh, and his kingdom was a reflection of God's kingdom in that it was, you know, a restoration of God's presence, and it was this figurative re-entry into the Garden of Eden. But of course, we know uh, that Solomon was not the ultimate Messiah, and ultimately had some pretty devastating failures during his reign, and we're going to look at some of that in more detail today. Uh, but first, we wanted to go over some of Solomon's other accomplishments because there were actually there's a lot of other stuff that he did other than building the temple and Israel just enjoyed unprecedented wealth and abundance and influence during Solomon's reign and so that was a big reason why in following generations people were looking and hoping for someone else like Solomon to come and to lead them back into that prosperity. So we're going to take a few minutes to start with to just get an overview of all of his, his accomplishments and his acquisitions. I think it's interesting, David, that when we think of Solomon, we think of the temple. Like that's like the, one of the big things that we think of it. It's, mm -hmm. it's amazing how we can define people by just uh, one event or by, um, you know, one, one major accomplishment in their lives. Like that's like the one thing that they're known for. Um, and Chronicles kind of, as it covers people, kind of gives you the one event highlight of different people's lives, where Kings gives us a lot more details about the things that that the person did, It's a, especially in Solomon's case. It's, there's just so much there. Um, so we're going to do what? we got five chapters we're going to go through this morning. Is that what we're up to now, David? Yeah, five chapters, yeah. Cool. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and the, the first one we want to look at is in 1 Kings 9. Um, well, you don't have you can turn there, just mark it. 1 Kings 9, uh, verses 10 through 14, talks about King Hiram of Tyre, who gave Solomon uh, all the cedar trees and the cypress logs and the gold. Um, literally, it's his every wish, um, and sent him, what, 9,000 pounds of gold. Um, <laughs> So when you think about accomplishments, uh, Solomon definitely had a lot that was given to him um, and definitely had this great relationship with King Hiram. And one of his, his major accomplishments, I think, was there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And re remember, too, how Solomon, we looked at last week, he made himself a son-in-law to the Pharaoh. In other words, he married his, his daughter the, uh, of the king of Egypt. That ended up working out really well for him. Too. So after you get that bit about King Hiram giving him everything he wanted and all that gold, uh, you, in verse 16 of chapter 9, uh, we read this. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had attacked and captured Gezer. He then burned it, killed the Canaanites who lived in the city, and gave it as a dowry to his daughter Solomon's wife. Then Solomon rebuilt Gezer, lower Beth Horon, Baleth, uh, Tamar in the wilderness of Judah, all of the storage cities that belonged to Solomon, the chariot cities, the cavalry cities, and whatever Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, Lebanon, or anywhere else in the land of his dominion. As for all the people who remained of the Amorites, Hethites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites who were not Israelites, their descendants who remained in the land after them, those whom the Israelites were unable to destroy completely, Solomon imposed forced labor on them. It is still this way today, but Solomon did not consign the Israelites to slavery. They were soldiers, his servants, his commanders, his captains, and commanders of his chariots and his cavalry. 
These were the deputies who were over Solomon's work, 550 who supervised the people doing the work. So Egypt, this kingdom which you know, a few generations ago was oppressing and enslaving the Israelites, is now allied with Israel and actually helped Solomon suppress and enslave their enemies and to expand their borders. And did you notice that term in there? It says he had storage cities, just like a whole city, just to store all your stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I, that's I, was, I, I was more impressed with the chariot and cavalry cities. I mean, they're like entire, what, like neighborhoods of people with chariots and horses and everything, like, like entire cities of just wow. people who dealt with horses. Come on, you have to have a bad pun every now and then, David. Wow, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Uh, so then w w the end of chapter nine then uh, ends with some more verses describing even more of uh, Solomon's achievements. It says, Pharaoh's daughter moved from the city of David to the house that Solomon had built for her. He then built the terraces. Three times a year, Solomon offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings on the altar he had built for the Lord, and he burned incense with them in the Lord's presence. So he completed the temple. King Solomon put together a fleet of ships at Ezion Geber, which is near Eloth on the, shower, on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. With the fleet, Hiram sent his servants, experienced seamen, along with Solomon's servants. And they went to Ophir and acquired gold there, 16 tons, and delivered it to Solomon. <laughs> Again, that's just so much gold, I can't even fathom. Um, but things are looking really good here. Uh, the, the wife from Egypt is really working out for him. He's worshiping at the altar that he himself built. I have to imagine that would have just felt pretty satisfying. And he has this whole fleet of ships just continuously delivering him gold in tons. Uh, so life is pretty sweet. Uh, and so naturally all this is happening uh, and it's, it's making waves. News of all this activity is gonna spread and Solomon gained quite a uh, reputation for himself. So he's now known for his unprecedented wisdom, his glorious temple, and this unfathomable wealth. And this reputation is not just among Israel, it's, it's international. And we see that in chapter 10, uh, which begins with this a story of an encounter he has with the Queen of Sheba. And Sheba would have been to the southwest of Israel in the region of where Ethiopia is. So we're going to read through the first part of chapter 10. Mike, do you want to read that for us? Sure. Chapter 10, verse 1. I'm, I'm listening to all the people tapping on their phone right now, getting to their app. Yeah. So. <laughs> Whereas normally it'd be so, like the pages rustling in church. And, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So the Queen of Sheba heard, uh, which is actually the Hebrew word shmaf, right? The, the Queen of Sheba heard about Solomon's fame connected with the name of the Lord and came to test him with riddles. She came to Jerusalem with a very large entourage with camels bearing spices, gold in great abundance and precious stones. She came to Solomon and spoke to him about everything that was on her mind. So Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too difficult for the king to explain to her. When the Queen of Sheba observed all of Solomon's wisdom, the palace he had built, the food at his table, his servants' residence, his attendants' service at their, their, their attire, his cupbearers, the burnt offerings he offered at Yahweh's temple. It took her breath away. She said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your words and your wisdom is true, but I didn't believe the report until I came and saw it with my own eyes. Indeed, I was not even told half. Your wisdom and prosperity far exceed the report I heard. How happy are your men? How happy are these servants of yours who always stand in your presence hearing your wisdom? Blessed be the God, blessed be Yahweh, your God. He delighted in you and put you on the throne of Israel. Because of Yahweh's eternal love for Israel, he made you a king to carry out justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king four and a half tons of gold a great quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again did such a quantity of spices arrive as those the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. In addition, Hiram's fleet that carried gold from Ophir brought from Ophir a large quantity of almug wood 
and precious stones. Now, almond wood, you should know, is like sandalwood. We would have a very modern day sandalwood. Um, the king made the almond wood into steps for Yahweh's temple and the, king, and the king's palace and into lyres and harps for the singers. Never before did such almond wood arrive and the like has not been seen again. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba her every desire, whatever she asked, besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. Then she, along with her servants, returned to her own country. Um, yeah, this is kind of one of those passages that, that makes you nervous, doesn't it, David? It's like, oh, yeah. oh, there's a woman There's a woman showing up. This is going to be trouble, you know? A foreign woman, the strange foreign woman, and she's a queen. Uh, yeah, that be how it starts off um, kind of makes it seem like this could be spelling disaster. And I just wonder, hmm, she's going to, it even says she wants to see if she can uh, stump him, basically. So it's like, how is she going to trip Solomon up? This is, this is going to end badly. Uh, but it doesn't, you know, instead her tour of Solomon's kingdom actually results in her praising Yahweh and Solomon's glory is, seems to be bringing glory to God in this situation. And then she just, she returns to her own country. She didn't cause any trouble. And that whole story is wrapped up nice and neatly. Um, so it's perfect. Uh, yeah. And I think that that goes, you had asked the question, like, why would God put all these riches in front of Solomon? If, it, if he knew that riches were going to be a temptation, right? And uh, I think that when you see the way that that brings glory to God, in this case, you could see why God would do it. You, you know what I'm saying? It's like, the, it, yeah. it wasn't just about Solomon's glory. It was about God's glory and all of that. Um, an interesting note, though, um, both Kings and Chronicles cover the story, but Chronicles adds a little extra spice to it. Um, in Second Chronicles 9.12, it said, King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba her every desire, whatever she asked for, far more than she had brought the king. And then she, along with her, her servants, returned to her own country. So the queen came with gifts to impress Solomon and left impressed by God and returned with more than she came with, which is a really interesting little twist. Um, you know, she thought she was coming with all this stuff to impress him. And when she left, she left impressed and with more wealth than she brought to him. Really yeah. cool. That's cool. I, and I caught your second pun and within five minutes to add more bad. spice to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I might have some more. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, that, that story is definitely significant. And I think that makes sense why is it, it is included in Chronicles, whereas some of the other details are not um, because it does demonstrate uh, how God can use, you know, wealth and splendor to bring glory to himself. So that's cool. Um, then we continue in chapter 10 to get more of an idea of, of his, of the wealth and the opulence that he had. Um, so we're now to verse 14. And um, I guess I can, I'll read this one. The weight of gold that came to Solomon annually was 25 tons besides what came from merchants, traders, merchandise, and all the Arabian kings and governors of the land. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 15 pounds of gold went into each shield. He made 300 small shields of hammered gold. Nearly four pounds of gold went into each shield. The king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king also made a large ivory throne and overlaid it with fine gold. The throne had six steps. There was a rounded top at the back of the throne, armrests on either side of the seat, and two lions standing beside the armrests. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps, one at each end. Nothing like it had ever been made in any other kingdom. All of King Solomon's drinking cups were gold, and all the utensils of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. There was no silver since it was considered as nothing in Solomon's time. For the king had ships of Tarshish at sea with uh, Hiram's fleet. And once every three years, the ships of Tarshish would arrive bearing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the world in riches and in wisdom. The whole world wanted an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that God had put in his heart. 
every man would bring his annual tribute, items of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, and horses and mules. Solomon accumulated 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen and stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedar as abundant as sycamore in the Judean foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and Kew. The king's traders bought, uh, bought them from Kew at the going price. A chariot was imported from Egypt for 15 pounds of silver and a horse for nearly four pounds. In the same way, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and to the kings of Aram through their agents. <laughs> so that's it's a lot. I it's I don't know about you. I can I really I can't even wrap my head around that much wealth and opulence. Um, so chapter ten is a really a good summary of Solomon's achievements. It starts with that example of his fame and his reputation and how that spread internationally, and then it ends with this overview of just all of his accumulations. And if you remember the end of chapter four, um, it makes kind of a similar list, but it's more focused on the, to the fruits of Solomon's wisdom, like the 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs and teachings on all sorts of different topics. And Lord willing, we'll actually talk about that aspect of Solomon's legacy next week. Um, yeah. And if you've been comparing to the Chronicles to Kings, you'll notice that in Chronicles, um, the weight of those shields is different. Um, huh. yeah, so the, they both had different weights as far as how much gold, but the, the idea of having so much gold that you actually made shields and put them on the wall as a decoration, you know, with whether it was five pounds or 15 pounds or seven pounds of gold to hammer out a shield is just, just I can't even imagine anything quite like that. Um, the other thing it said too in Chronicles was that it wasn't just all the men that brought tributes, all the kings from the surrounding regions would come and bring tribute to Solomon, which also then paints him in this picture of a king of kings, which again, mm. keeping with that Messiah theme, you have Solomon being the king that all the other kings look up to because of his blessing from God and his wisdom. And he becomes a king of kings where other kings pay tribute to him. And so just an interesting, subtle uh, little thing that Chronicles brings up that I think helps to talk to kind of uh, enforce that Messiah concept that we've been talking about with Solomon. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, whether it's regardless of the exact weight, the point is still, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. Okay. Um, so those chapters are focused mainly on just the accumulation so far of wisdom and wealth and fame and physical goods. And then we get to chapter 11 and we find out about this other, it's another type of accumulation that's also happening. Um, it, in verse one, it says that King Solomon loved many foreign women in addition to Pharaoh's daughter, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations about which Yahweh had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, and they must not intermarry with you, because they will turn your heart away to follow their gods. To these women, Solomon was deeply attached in love. Oh no. <laughs> so <laughs> we've gotten to some bad news. <laughs> uh, so that situation with the Queen of Sheba turned out fine, right? Well, it was sort of may have felt a little foreboding it was okay uh, but then these women are clearly presented right off the bat as just being a problem for Solomon because this is just an obvious violation of what God had commanded and it gets pretty much right to the point in saying that his his many wives uh, were Solomon's downfall yeah he didn't just have a few of them either did he I mean, yeah. this gets crazy. This gets really <laughs> yeah. crazy. Just what does that phrase "many wives" mean? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and when I think of the accomplishments of Solomon, the funny thing is, is this is the other thing that I think is most often quoted: is how many wives and concubines he had. Um, mm. But let me read this passage, and you yeah. can go out with the commentary. Uh, in First Kings eleven, starting in verse three, he had seven hundred wives who were princesses and 300 who were concubines, and they turned his heart away. And when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. 
he was not wholeheartedly devoted to Yahweh, his God, as his father David had been. Solomon followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in Yahweh's sight. And unlike his father David, he did not remain loyal to Yahweh. At that time, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abhorrent idol of Moab, and Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites, on the hill across from Jerusalem. He did the same for all his foreign wives who were burning incense and offering sacrifices to their gods. Um, like I, I think of that phrase that they threw in there, David, just to kind of, uh, I know this isn't in our notes here, but that phrase, as his father David had been, mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that uh, it says his heart wasn't like his father David as far as being wholeheartedly for God, and yet his stumbling point was very much the same as, as his father's. True. Yeah, yep. And if you if you did the the math, that was seven seven hundred plus three hundred, so that's a thousand thousand wives in total. So that, say that word many is a bit of an understatement. <laughs> and uh, that statement that seven hundred were princesses also that implies that those were politically motivated marriages. They were daughters of kings, like the first one that was mentioned, uh, like his marriage to Pharaoh's daughter. So, David, you do realize that we're bringing this up on Mother's Day, right? <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> Happy Mother's Day, everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, it wasn't intentional, but. Yeah. Um, a side note, by the way, is that Chronicles does not cover this part of the story. Um, Chronicles covers just the accomplishments of Solomon um, and the Queen of Sheba is recorded. But this, this apostasy, this, this part where his heart turns away from God to women is totally left out of Chronicles hmm. or included in Kings intentionally. I mean, whether it was you know, left out on purpose or whether it was added to this one on purpose, there, there's an intentionality of it being in the scriptures, even though it's not stated in both uh, of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, it's definitely very straightforward in saying that he messed up and ultimately it was these these foreign wives who turned his heart away from god um and you brought up that verse six is a, such a key statement that says unlike his father david he did not remain loyal to yahweh so despite all of these accomplishments and these strengths he's he's described in contrast to his father david in in his faithfulness to god now david wasn't perfect we saw that we, we looked at some of his weaknesses his sin and the consequences of that uh, that were suffered in fact, David actually had foreign wives mm. himself. However, they didn't turn him away. Um, and he was repentant when he did sin. And he was faithful to worship Yahweh alone um, and didn't worship any other, you know, foreign idols and foreign gods. So God was then, he, God regarded him as faithful. Uh, but before before we look at the consequences, because we're going to look at that of, of Solomon's apostasy, uh, I want to pause for a minute and reflect on how he ended up here, worshiping other gods. If everything was going so well, God had blessed him with all this wisdom and wealth, so many great things were happening. So why on earth would he go and ruin it by worshiping these other gods? And I know, well, first of all, uh, we know... <laughs> that just one woman can make a man do crazy things. Right? And we saw that with David and Bathsheba. And it, especially like in that situation, I'm not blaming the woman for this at all, but the men. <laughs> um, if you see the effect that one woman can have on a man, I can't imagine the influence of, of a thousand, you know, <laughs> imagine just trying to, to keep all of them happy. <laughs> and I get, I'm, this is not a rag on, on women or wives and not blaming them or belittling them at all. Just this is to point out the stupidity of Solomon in his decision um, to have all of these wives. Um, but that said, you know, th that was definitely a, a key factor, but I think this also goes deeper and there's a lot more to Solomon's failure uh, than just his wives. So if we look back um, and like Mike said, it really goes back to a matter of his heart not being in the right place. So let's look back at some of his accomplishments. Uh, and I think we need to ask, 
were these really accomplishments or were they actually failures disguised as accomplishments? And in order to do that, I think we need to look back at the guidelines that God actually set back in Deuteronomy uh, when Moses and the Israelites were in the wilderness and God was giving them the law. <clears throat> part of that actually included some guidelines for kings. Uh, so this is in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. Do you want to read that passage, Mike? I do. Sorry, I was looking. I was looking up another verse there. Okay, no, Deuteronomy, okay. Deuteronomy seventeen fourteen. Um, when you enter the land Yahweh your God is giving you, take possession of it, live in it, and you'll say, "I will set a king over me, like all the nations around me." You are to appoint over you the king Yahweh your God chooses. Appoint a king from your brothers. You are not to set a foreigner <laughs> over you or one who is not for, of your people. However, he must not acquire many horses for himself or send people back to Egypt to acquire many horses. For Yahweh has told you, you are never to go back that way again. You must not, he must not acquire many wives for himself so that his heart won't go astray. He must not acquire very large amounts of silver and gold for himself. When he is seated on his royal throne, he is to write a copy of this instruction for himself on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. It is to remain with him, and he is to read from it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to fear Yahweh his God, to observe all the words of this instruction and to do these statutes. Then his heart will not be exalted above his countrymen. He will not turn from this command to the right or to the left, and he and his sons will continue reigning many years in Israel. So, you know, it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. After reading that passage, it seems like this passage in First Kings is directly calling out each of these instructions as having been specifically violated by Solomon. Um, I think to help visualize that, to put quotes side by side uh, from Deuteronomy and First Kings, um, and I think Mike can share share his screen to to show you a, a chart uh, that I came up with. Um, if you look at Deuteronomy, it says he must not acquire many horses for himself. And in 1 Kings, it says Solomon accumulated 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen. <laughs> That's many horses. Uh, he must not send the people back to Egypt to acquire many horses. Specifically says Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and Q. He must not acquire many wives for himself so that his heart won't go astray. King Solomon loved many foreign women. He even he had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 who were concubines, and they turned his heart away. It's like it's almost word for word uh, reflecting Deuteronomy. Um, he must not acquire. Oh, there's a typo there. He, he must not acquire very large amounts of silver and gold for himself. <laughs> The weight of gold that came to Solomon annually was 25 tons, and the king made silver as, co as common in Jerusalem as stones. And then there's this bit that says that he's supposed to write down these instructions in front of the priests and read them every day. You know, when he sits on the throne, he needs to be thinking about these things. And obviously, there's no mention of him <laughs> reading these instructions uh, because clearly that just wouldn't work. <laughs> uh, and then finally, the, just his heart would not be exalted above his countrymen. And seeing that the, the king made this large ivory throne and overlaid it with fine gold, the throne had six steps. So he literally, you know, he was elevating himself uh, to a, a higher position. And then he, he enacted slave labor and collected tribute. Um, so you, you see his his heart being exalted above the people in that way. Uh, it's just, it, it's again, it's almost word for word playing off of Deuteronomy. Yeah. And there's even, even the, the phrasing in between Chronicles and Kings. Um, it wasn't just that he imported the horses, but as we've read, it's like his, his purchasers went to Egypt mm -hmm. and bought them and brought them back. Um, I mean, it was very specific that it wasn't just like, oh, somebody from Egypt sent him some horses. It's like, no, he sent somebody there to buy them and bring them back. Um, and the, the exalted, one thing to, to keep in mind, too, about the forced labor, though, I think it specifically said that the forced laborers were not the Israelites. Correct. Um, 
Yeah. They were the other nations around him, but not the Israelites. But the the people definitely felt a burden um, in going with this idea of being exalted above his, above his countrymen. Later on, when Solomon is succeeded by his son, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of complaining about how hard it was uh, on the people with Solomon as mm -hmm. their king. So definitely that is being brought out later on um, with Rehoboam. Mm -hmm. uh, with the fact that Solomon had elevated himself above his country in that quite a bit. Yeah. And the fact that he did not enslave the Israelites was a good thing. And that was in keeping with the law uh, that specifically said not to enslave your, you know, fellow Israelites. Uh, however, like you said, it was pretty, he was pretty tough on the Israelites and even just the spirit of slavery um, <laughs> was not, I don't think it's painted in, in a very positive light. In, in fact, he looks more like the Pharaoh of Exodus um, in all of this, enslaving the foreigners and, you know, all of this really is making him look like the, the big bad villain of the past. <clears throat> well, yeah. And going back to the whole Exodus event, I think what blows my mind in all of this is, as you mentioned, it sounds like they're like this passage was written specifically about Solomon, almost as if somebody's standing in front of Solomon and saying, these are the things you shouldn't be doing that you're doing. And yet this, these verses were not written to Solomon. They were written to the Israelites in the wilderness after leaving Egypt. Before, before they even were <laughs> thinking of having a king. <laughs> well, that's right. They had no king. and they, they hadn't even asked for a king yet. And God gave them specific instructions about the king. Um, and when they demanded a king to be like all the other nations, God knew they would do that. He let it happen. But it sound, it, it just when I read it, it's just, my mind just explodes thinking about the fact that all those years before God knew the exact details of what the heart of Israel would be. And he knew what Solomon was going to struggle with. And he, it's like, it's like he wrote this about Solomon's scenario years and years and years before Solomon was even born, knowing what Solomon would do. And so if you're one of those people that just likes to ponder and contemplate the, the sovereignty of God and the omniscience of God, this is one of those times where you can geek out and just really enjoy it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I remember when when this first hit me, um, this realization of the connection there, it just totally blew my mind. I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, and all these things, so many things that looked like and would, ha <clears throat> would have to them at that time looked and felt like wonderful accomplishments were in reality actually failures to obey God. And this reminds me of a lesson, that same lesson that Saul learned the hard way. If you remember back in 1 Samuel, uh, when Samuel said to Saul after he refused to wipe out all of the, the people he was supposed to wipe out, he saved some of the animals to, to sacrifice to God. Um, Samuel said, does Yahweh take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying Yahweh? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. Um, and yes, yeah, sorry, that's 1 Samuel 15, uh, verse 22. Um, so this principle that obedience is better than sacrificing or doing things that are otherwise, you know, what we would think is good things, um, obedience is, is better. And that's a principle that holds true for us today. Um, though none of us are you know, kings, we don't really need to worry about importing horses from, from Egypt. But we do need to remember that all the good deeds that we do in the world are worthless if we're not doing what God has called us to do. And at, at the core, what does, what does God require of us? Um, the day-to-day -day details of what that looks like obviously varies greatly for each person, but invariably, it starts with a common core. And we find that in back in Deuteronomy, again, uh, when Moses is addressing Israel uh, in, in chapter 10, verse 12, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you except to fear the Lord your God by walking in all his ways to love him and to worship the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. So that's at the core of, of everything um, that we do. If, if it doesn't start there, if our heart isn't starting there, um, then it's going to be worthless. 
Yeah, and I think that going back to the list of all the things that Solomon did wrong and comparing that chart, when we read about God um, being upset with Solomon, um, it has to do mostly with the fact that Solomon stopped loving God. Mm -hmm. Solomon stopped worshiping God. It wasn't, he didn't call out the horses and chariots. He didn't call out mm -hmm. the, the foreign wives per se, but it was about the fact that he had lost that, that first love concept. Yes. Yeah. And that's also a reminder that while, you know, wealth and prosperity, those aren't things that are inherently wrong. And in fact, God really takes great pleasure in blessing people. Uh, but our, our motives and our methods can certainly be wrong. Uh, and if our focus is just on the accumulation of wealth or for, of success or fame, instead of bringing glory to God and loving God, then we'll have totally missed the mark. So it's, it's clear that God uh, has, you know, called out Solomon's disobedience. Um, Solomon's messed up in all kinds of ways. So now we get to what the consequences of that um, are going to be. What, what's the fallout of this disobedience? <laughs> I think I jumped ahead of the notes a little bit. Sorry, David. Did you? I did when I talked about what he, his disobedience. My bad. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> so first Kings chapter 11 <clears throat> verses nine through 13. Um, we kind of read about yes. what God's going to do here, the consequences of, of God, uh, of Solomon's actions. And because God was very specific that certain things had to be done or certain things were going to happen. And so here we read a little bit about that. Uh, verse nine, Yahweh was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from Yahweh, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And he commanded him about this so that he would not follow other gods. But Solomon did not do what Yahweh has com had commanded. Then Yahweh said to Solomon, since you have done this and did not keep my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you, I will tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. However, I will not do it during your lifetime for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of your son's hand. Yet I will not tear the entire kingdom away from him. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I chose. Yeah, so God's promising basically is the, the major consequence uh, to take away all but just a small remnant of Israel from the line of, of David's rule. So because of Solomon's sin, we now have this nation that's headed towards destruction from from both within and from foreign enemies. Um, and we don't have time to read through all the details of what happens, but if you do um, read through it, you'll see family dysfunction and invading enemies. Eventually we're gonna end up with a divided kingdom and kings that are even worse than, than Solomon was. Um, the rest of chapter 11 describes first how God raised up some enemies against Solomon and then appointed his son Jeroboam to take 10 tribes away from the kingdom. And actually, when Solomon hears about that, he actually tries to kill Jeroboam, his own son. And then when his other son, Rehoboam, takes the throne, um, those two brothers remain at odds against each other. So eventually, Jeroboam is made king over most of Israel in the north, while Rehoboam is king over the tribes of Judah and Benjamin in the south, which is then referred to uh, mainly just as Judah. So this is really key to recognize that pretty much from this point on, after Solomon's death, the rest of First and Second Kings is telling a story of two separate kingdoms. And it lists a whole bunch of kings who came after Solomon, uh, but it, it switches back and forth between Israel and Judah. And that can be really confusing if you don't catch that split that happens here. It's kind of in the middle of First Kings and it, it describes how it all happens. But it's just important to recognize that now there's two separate kingdoms, um, and it gives this list of kings uh, throughout the rest of the, the book. And it's it's kind of a bleak list. <laughs> For a lot of them, That's, it really does. <laughs> Go ahead. It's awful. It's just <laughs> awful. They're, yeah. they're just bad people. Yeah, and for some of them, it doesn't even really give a lot of detail. There are some stories kind of scattered throughout um, of what 
specific things that some of them did, but for some of them, it really just doesn't give information other than they it, it categorize um, it categorizes them either as a good or a bad king uh, based on some simple criteria. Um, basically, were they faithful to worship Yahweh alone? Um, did they help their kingdom also worship Yahweh by getting rid of an idolatry in their kingdom? And were they faithful to keep the terms of God's covenant with Israel? So it doesn't measure them in terms of, you know, success or wealth or wisdom, um, but whether or not they were faithful to God. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a crazy, crazy list. And again, that's the one criteria that I think Solomon was judged on was his faithfulness <laughs> to God, not exactly. the wealth and everything. Yeah. Um, but the author lists, those 20 kings from each kingdom in Judah, only eight of those are listed as good, 12 are bad. So in the southern part, you have eight, eight that are good, 12 that are bad. In Israel, the northern kingdom, 10 tribes, all 12 of them are bad. I mean, they're all just bad apples. All 20, all 20. Yeah. All 20, I'm sorry, all 20 are bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you have out of 40 kings, you have 32 kings that are just bad people. That, and, and as you read about them, it's like, did evil in the sight of the Lord. It was worse than the person before them. It's just like, it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Like, like Israel's sinking lower and lower and lower. Um, so you have this legacy that Solomon left of building a temple and of the wisdom and of the opulence of, of God. But then you have this other legacy that Solomon left that because of his disobedience to God, Israel is divided into two kingdoms and continues to go further and further away from, from God. And the, the gods that they're serving, the idols that they're serving are the exact ones that Solomon set up high places to and that he was establishing for his wives. Um, and so that seems to be like the standard as you go through the other kings. Did they get rid of the Ashtoreth poles? Did they do this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, but this is also the beginning of something new too, in that this is when you start to see God raising up prophets to speak on his behalf and to call out these kingdom kingdoms um, in the ways that they violated the covenant and committing idolatry and um, creating a society full of injustice and violence and division. It's during this time period that you find stories of some of the really famous prophets like Elijah and Elisha, um, as well as some others that, you know, are not quite as well known. Those guys kind of like Trump everybody when it comes to, you know, the prophets, it's like, they're the big guys, mm -hmm. but so you enter into this new phase with Solomon, you have the age of wisdom, which we're going to look at the wisdom literature, Lord willing next week. But after Solomon, you have this, uh, this reign or this, uh, this season or epoch of, of the prophets that come in to speak to the kings and to Israel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, occasionally the prophets would have some temporary success in turning people back to Yahweh. Um, but ultimately, the, the kings and their people pretty much, they just got worse and worse, like you said. And so eventually that all leads up to them being conquered totally and then exiled, kicked out. Um, as the ultimate punishment and consequence for their actions. So just as we looked at how the temple symbolized a return to the Garden of Eden, the exile from the promised land would then represent their, their banishment from it. Hey, don't and, get too far ahead of the story, David. Come on. Yeah, I know. We'll, we'll, we'll go more into the exile later on. But uh, for now, I just, we wanted to trace that consequence, that ultimate consequence, um, as a direct result of Solomon's unfaithfulness. Because after Solomon, everything just spiraled downward. Um, and not only was we see that Solomon was not the promised Messiah, um, he ended up becoming the opposite of what the Messiah was supposed to do. And just a quick side note on that word Messiah, technically he was a Messiah because that word literally just means anointed one or chosen one. And it was used throughout the Old Testament to, in those times to refer to any the kings and the priests who were chosen. So in that sense, they were a chosen person. And in that sense, they would have been looked to, to see maybe they're the Messiah, you know, maybe they're that one who's going to really, you know, do it all. But, you know, eventually we see that none of them did um, until we get to, to Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. There's a lot of words like that in our Old Testament, right? So you have God, um, El, and you have Elohim, and you have God, but then is it the God? Or is it just a God? Right. 
Yes. Um, yeah. The same word Elohim refers to the Yahweh God and the gods of all the other nations that, you know, and, and false gods that don't even exist. Uh, it's also referred, used to refer to humans <laughs> by Jesus. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting. And, and the word Messiah is, you know, it's the transliteration of um, the Hebrew word, um, which then was translated into Greek as Christos. So Messiah and Christ are also the same word. Um, so when we say Jesus Christ, it's Jesus the Messiah. It's the same, the same thing. Cool. But it's a total rabbit so what's, trail. <laughs> it is. It is. We're <laughs> we're used to that, aren't we? So, yeah. um, so, so what's the takeaway from this? Um, we, we brought up Solomon on purpose as part of our uh, overview of the Bible because of the fact of, of several facts. One is that he uh, typifies the Messiah. Uh, two is that he enters, he ushers in an era in Israel that was different from anybody else's, uh, an era of wisdom and of putting God on display like he's never been put on display before, establishing a permanent home, a temple, which is still going to be a, even with all the divided kingdom, that temple is still going to be a, a very important fixture in the lives of the Israelites. Um, Solomon, it just ends up... Uh, being a ruler that was so great in so many ways um, and yet he falls short and uh, just like Israel rose under David and Solomon it tanks and it dies really fast right after Solomon um, and you see the intensity build for the need for the Messiah especially mm -hmm. after Solomon with the kings and with, with the prophets that are coming after. And this is all part of that history of Israel that takes us to that New Testament. When, when Jesus shows up as the Messiah, they're looking for somebody that's better than Solomon, that's better than David. Um, you know, Solomon, Moses. again, better than Moses, right? The new Moses. Um, so uh, it's part of the big picture story, uh, the, the idea of a kingdom, the idea of God's presence among people, the idea of wisdom coming from God, it all starts in Genesis, it continues through, we see it played out in different ways. And that's all part of our story too. You know, where do we choose to define wisdom? Where do we choose to get our wisdom from? Um, how do we define success and accomplishments? Um, do we define accomplishments by how much gold we have, by how much we have in our savings account, by how big our house is, by our cars? Or do we define our success and our accomplishments by our obedience to Yahweh. Um, the, the struggle that Solomon had is no different than the struggle that you and I have today. Mm -hmm. Though I don't can't say I've had 15 pounds of gold to consider hammering into a shield. Um, but it's still the same challenge, right? I mean, it's it's is am I am I going to elevate myself above others, or am I going to um, re remember that we're all created in the image of God? And then what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis um, and how I treat others and how I pray for others and, and how I respond to others? Am I elevating myself or am I recognizing we're all made in the image of God? So I think these are some very real things that we need to wrestle with and hopefully come out on the side of David and still end up being men and women after God's own heart mm -hmm. and not coming out like Solomon who eventually turns away from God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, like David, you know, we'll, we'll still mess up at times. Um, the important thing is to then repent and turn our hearts to God, um, accept the consequences that may, that may occur. Um, but it all goes back to, yeah, like we're going to have different, it's going to play out in different ways, but it comes back to the same heart issues as we see in the old Testament, even thousands of years ago. Um, we're not dealing with, you know, pounds of gold and horses, but, um, yeah, it's the same thing as the savings account and cars. So, um, yeah, it's a great reminder that it still has yeah, practical application today. Definitely. Now, with that, um, Solomon also, though, as we look at the next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at the wisdom literature. You're going to see Solomon. Um, you're going to see the wisdom of Solomon. You're going to see the conclusion he comes to about all the wealth. Um, which is not necessarily what we see brought out in First Kings. And so we're going to see some contrasts even in the mind of Solomon as he's processing all these things. Um, so, uh, so what you'll want to do between now and next week is read through the book of, uh, you can read through Ecclesiastes, 
and read through Proverbs. We're going to actually cover both of those books in their entirety. Um, and Job. Right, David? And, and Job. Job. And, and Job. Song of Solomon. Oh, great. All four of them in one Sunday. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So, pa so pack your lunch. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do? So uh, yeah, David, why don't you uh, close our time out in, in prayer? We'll answer, we'll give you a couple of announcements and then answer questions that anybody has about, uh, about the message. Yeah. Let's pray.